Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace and greetings to all of you in the name of Allah. The Muslim Student Association extends a warm and cordial welcome to our guest speaker, Mr. Ahmad Didat, the staff and students of Natal Computer College. Mr. Didat will be discussing the topic, the Quran and the computer. After his talk, questions will be given the opportunity, uh, students will be given the opportunity to ask Mr. Didat any questions. Please feel free to ask him any questions whatsoever. Uh, Mr. Didat. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It means peace and blessings of God to each and every one of you. I feel privileged to come to speak to your computer college. And the subject that I have chosen is the Quran and the computer. Naturally, you are inquisitive wanting to know that this book of Islam, the Holy Quran, which was revealed 1,400 years ago, did it have anything to say about the computer? Mr. Didat, you ask. How do you fit in the Quran with the computer? I said, you see, for a long time I myself didn't see it. I have been reading the Quran in a translation form like this one. The Arabic text with the translation. And I have been reading verses and they gave me some faint idea. But I didn't have a very clear picture until about 1975. How did it come about that I can see this relationship between the Quran and the computer? In 1975, I get a phone call from Zambia telling me that air tickets are waiting for me at the South African Airways. I must go and pick them up to visit Zambia on a lecture tour. So I rushed down to the center in Ellywall Street and Smith Street corner. South African Airways and I go to the man at the reception and I tell him that I have had a phone call from Lusaka, Zambia telling me that an air ticket is waiting for me I have come to pick it up and I know what I was expecting I was expecting a, a booklet coupons you know what air tickets look like those coupons so I was expecting such a thing like that so I asked him that look I have come for it so he tells me he said see one of these ladies about a dozen of them were seated uh, in a semicircular form with those terminals visual terminals he said see one of these ladies there how can you see one of those ladies to me only one person out of the lot might have had my tickets. I know what tickets look like. So I'm asking him, which one? So the way the guy flays his hands, you know, and he tells me, like any one of them. I said, look, I'm speaking so nicely to the man. Why should he be so impolite? Is it because he's a white man and I'm an Indian? But I had no alternative. The way he <laughs> directed me <laughs> I had to go the first lady I saw was doing nothing she was sitting at the terminal I go up to her I said excuse me madam I have had a phone call from Lusaka and they tell me that there is an air ticket waiting for me I have come to pick it up she asked me what's your name so I tell her my name is Ahmad Didat she says spell it so I started spelling it A H M E D Ahmad, D-E-E-D-A-T, D-D-A-T. While I am spelling, she is typing on the keyboard before her. She said, yes. In other words, that means she's got it. Yes, so what now? <laughs> so I said, you see, I want to go from Durban to Johannesburg in the evening, on a Tuesday evening. What have you got for me? What can I do? What arrangements? She said, well, there is one at 6 p.m. I said, right. That suits me fine. 
Can you book me on? He says, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. It's done. So I tell her, you see, on Wednesday now, the next day, I want to reach L Lusaka at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. That's what my host in Zambia told me. I must arrive there at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I want to be there at 3 o'clock. Now, what arrangements can you make for that? So she typed again on the keyboard. And she's asking me, do you want to go through Maputo or through Gaborons? I said, look, it doesn't matter. As long as I'm in Lusaka at 3 p.m. So she types again. And she said, you see, you are booked on Zambian Airlines. And no other, the other plane to transfer this ticket to another, this thing, we have to contact Zambian Airlines. And there's a national holiday in Zambia today, so we can't contact Zambian Airlines. So please, come tomorrow. And you can imagine my disappointment, walking from near the Mosque of Madrasa Arcade to Smith Street and expecting the ticket in my hands that it was almost within my reach, but not within my grasp. Disappointed come tomorrow. So I'm asking the lady, I says, Madam, where did you get all this information from? So she tells me this is from the head computer in Johannesburg. I said, you know, when you were trying to book me in at the six o'clock flight, suppose there was only one seat left and there were more than one of these terminals might have been trying to get the ticket. What happens then? He says, no, the first one within the second he gets ahead, he, says he gets a ticket, and the rest is blank. How does this happen? He said, you see, every computer in the country, which is connected to the head computer, has access to that knowledge. The head computer in Johannesburg. Everyone with this terminal can, has access to that. I said, I see. And I came out. Walking back to my offices in Madras Arcade. While I'm walking back, the thought occurs to me that this is how this Quran was revealed. This Quran. And a verse from the Quran, from the 85th chapter, the last verses 21 and 23, the last verses, tells me, Sabal huwa Quranun majidun fi mahfuz. That nay, this is inscribed in the glorious Quran from a tablet preserved. From a preserved tablet. Now if you have a volume like this, and if you want to know what the Quran says about the Quran, you open just like in a dictionary, in Q, Q and just like in the index, Q, and it will tell you everything the Quran says about the Quran. I give you examples. Quran, the divisions of the Quran, how it's divided into chapters and verses, inspired message, cannot be produced by other than divine agency, versus fundamental and allegorical, these are all different topics, God is witness to the Quran, God's revelation, the Quran, follow it and do right, the Quran, respect and attention due to it, book of wisdom, the Quran, it's in Arabic, the Quran, described, and on and on and on. What does the Quran say about the Quran? The last subject in this index on the, Q, on, in, uh, in, on the Quran, it says the tablet preserved. The tablet, this, when you have it, you'll be able to see it with your own eyes. It says tablet preserved, chapter 85, verses 21, 22. I read it to you. So the picture comes to me, this is how it happened. See, the whole picture comes along, the history of Muhammad, that he was in Medina, I have been reading, and a Christian deputation had come from Najran, an outskirt of Yemen. They had heard that another Arab now, he's claiming to be in communion with God, he's claiming to be a prophet. So these Christians, they said, let's go and see this Ar another Arab, and we will question him, cross-examine him, wanting to know what does he know about religion. So they come to Medina, and they are housed in the mosque of the Prophet. They sleep in the mosque, they eat in the mosque, and they have a dialogue in the mosque for three days and three nights. It's going on. 
During the course of that discussion, the spokesman for the Christian is posing the question, among so many other things. He said, all right, all right, now tell us, O Muhammad, what is your concept of God? And Muhammad, according to tradition, he doesn't just start answering. He, so to say, presses his spiritual buttons. There were no buttons to press. But I said, so to say, he presses his spiritual buttons. Trying to commune with God. He said, oh my Lord, what shall I say? What shall I say? He could have made a case. Like we do. At times when, I, when we are asked questions, we have no ready answers. So what do we do? We beat around the bush. We fumble to gather our thoughts. You see, it's like this and it's like that. And so on. While we are talking, while we are trying to share, you know, our thoughts are coming into focus. That's what we do. If I were to ask you, my children, what is six times six? Immediate answer. I take it. 36. 6, 6, uh, 36. I said, what is 12 times 12? We say 144. Because you have a ready answer. But if you didn't have a ready answer, what do you do? You say, well, you see, you know, 6 times 6, you take 6 and you put 6 times 6, 6, 6, and we add, and 6 and 6 is 12, and 3, 6 is 18. And you are fumbling for the answer, but you will get it, but you fumble for it. That's how what we, what we normally do. Muhammad doesn't do that. He could have said, you see, our concept of God is almost identical to yours. You see, you believe in the God of Abraham and the God of Moses and the God of... He says, well, we also believe... This is how we all talk. That's how we talk. Not so Muhammad. He's asked a question and he must get it from the highest authority, from the head computer. So what he does, he presses spiritual buttons and comes the answer through his mouth. He is the end terminal. Every prophet of God is an end terminal of that head computer, the knowledge of God. If you are that, you have access to that computer, the head computer, and you have a problem and you commune, say, oh my Lord, what shall I say? He said, tell them, Moses was told, tell them, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not commit thy neighbor's wife, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill. Is it? So he's telling them from the head computer, whatever knowledge is given, the prophet of God, the man of God, he articulates them. So he wants to know, what shall I say? Comes the answer. You'll see it in the 112th chapter of the Quran. Amazing. You open the chapter, it begins. Qul Allahu ahad. Say, he is God the one and only. Allahu samad, God the eternal absolute. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He does not beget and is not begotten. Wa lam yakun lahu kufu an ahad. And there's nothing like unto him. Finish. Whole chapter is finished. Four verses. And back to normal. He said, you see, this is our concept of God. When he spoke, while he was speaking, the normal discussion was on a different level of speech. Now, when he's uttering those words, he's on a different level. And back to normal. He said, you see, this is our... Where did he get it from? He's asking. Oh my Lord. Nobody heard him. Nobody heard him say that. But he's asking, what shall I say? Comes the answer. I want you to see it in this book. It starts. Say! He's God the one and only. Say, why? Say! A chapter begins, say, he is God the one and only. Why say? Because asked, what shall I say? Comes the answer, say, he is God the one and only. Now, this is how every verse of the Quran was revealed to the Holy Prophet Muhammad according to his needs from the head computer. He is the end terminal. As I said and I repeat, every prophet of God. Every true messenger of God is that end terminal. We are not. We haven't got that facility to make a direct contact with the head computer. Now this preserved tablet, what is a tablet? To me, that screen is a tablet. A visual screen. Your blackboard is a tablet. Your whiteboard or your green board, you know, on which you write is a tablet. Your computer chip is a tablet. 
the tablet of stone on which Moses wrote the Ten Commandments is a tablet. Now this tablet that God is talking about is not made of metal or, or, or stone or the silicone chip. It is a spiritual tablet, a spiritual knowledge. It is not material. Now what do you want to know? What else do you want to know? This is some aspect of what the Quran says about the Quran. What do you want to know about the Muslims and about Islam? Everything is in this book. The easiest way to have access to this knowledge about the Muslim is the book. We ourselves we might be confused. The Muslim can be confused on so many things. But if you want to know authoritatively, what does your book of authority, the Quran, say? So you go to the Quran. So if you open the index, some of the subjects, I'll just give you a, a, a quick glance at some of the subjects. This book, claiming to be from God, naturally it must tell us everything about God that we can know. So, in the G, look for God. There are more than 140 different references that you have access to from here, from this book, from this index. God. He is your protector. Chapter 2, verses 257 and onwards. He is the creator of all. He is most bountiful. He is merciful. He is most kind. He is beneficent. He is the orphan's shelter. He is the wanderer's guide. The guy's wandering around. He is a guide to him. He satisfies your needs. God present everywhere. He is unity. He is one, not one in a trinity. He is not one of two. He's got no begotten sons. He is wise. He is best disposed of affairs. He is most high great. He is irresistible. He is never unjust. He is exalted in power. He is free of all wants. He is worthy of all praise. And on and on and on. You want to know what does it say about man? And the M, look for man. Man means mankind, men and women. Man. Let's see what this is about man. Man. He is tested by God. He is being tested by God. In your behavior, what are you doing? How your mind is working? What you do? Things men covet. Things that men love most. And here, I might ask you, here, man as a male, I want you to tell me, if you can, what does he covet most? What does he love most? What does he want most? Huh? Money. Now don't be afraid, there's no, no harm done. We, we won't disqualify you in your exams. <laughs> yes, my child. Materialistic. Materialistic. Power. 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 Huh? Woman. Huh? Who said that? <laughs> Who said that? What did she say? Woman. 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 Yes, woman. <laughs> look, 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 this is this, this is 1400 years ago. This man, Muhammad, is made to say, things men covet. I want you to look it up when you have this book. You will have this book. Each and every one of you will be entitled to this book free. I'll be giving it to you all free. This encyclopedia. So no use me tantalizing before you. You know that golden carrot? And says, you see, it's there, it's there, it's there. <laughs> and he says, where do you get it? I say, you see, you go to the Islamic Propagation Center and you buy one. Now I want to do business with you. No, no, I'm not here to do business. So the Quran says, Say, in the sight of men is the love of things they covet. Number one, Minan Nisa of women. Well, Banin, then your offsprings, your children. And hoarded heaps of gold and silver and wealthy land and horses branded for excellence. These are the good things of this world's life, says the Quran. But the nearness to God is the best of goals to strive for. Number one, 
the greatest distraction for man is woman. <laughs> And I'm telling the Westerner, you see, look, as the Westerner, he knows this better than us. The Westerner, he knows this. See, he exploits this weakness of man to the limit. Lucian Motors in Smith Street, Durban. They advertise second-hand trucks. But on the trucks that they advertise, there's a woman in the bikini on top of the truck. <laughs> G Knots, they were in Field Street before, they've gone to North Dean now. G Knots, they sell farm implements, but on the tractors that they advertise, there's a woman in the bikini on top of the tractor. <laughs> I'm asking, what has a woman in the bikini got to do with a second-hand truck or with a tractor? <laughs> now you tell me. Except the man. <laughs> you know, he will, be he will be enticed to read. He'll be enticed to read. Because of that woman in the bikini. He wants to know, now what, what, about, what about her? So he reads about the tractor, he reads about second-hand trucks because of the woman in the bikini. Then BMW has beaten the lot. It's a motor car, from my understanding, a little better than the Mercedes-Benz. I have had my Volkswagen Beetle four times over, you know. I had the first one, 120,000 miles I did, and then next one and next one. Now they don't produce them anymore, those Beetles, you know. Uh, now I had to buy a Golf. First golf finished, then I had to buy a second golf, and I got my second or third one now. I'm still not in the market for a BMW. I don't know about you, Mr. Maharaj, Natal Computer <laughs> College. <laughs> so, but I see the advert in our daily news, our local paper. BMW motor car. Advertise. A, 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 a picture of the BMW motor car. In front of the motor car, there's a woman in the skimpiest of bikini, what you call the tanga, you know, the G-string. <laughs> And in front of the motor car, this woman is standing, you know, in a lustful, enticing pose. <laughs> you know, you can, you can almost hear her saying, come on, come on. <laughs> and it is written at the bottom, test drive her now. <laughs> Who? <laughs> Who? <laughs> the woman of the car. Who? Now you see what? I, I said I'm not in the market for it. But I had to read it. I had to read it. <laughs> you blame me? <laughs> I'm 73. But, but, but <laughs> ah, sorry, I've taken you off. Things men covet. You'll see it there. He's ungrateful. The ungrateful rich. Man. He's ever ungrateful. Leave out one to another. You know, we do some little favors for one another, and we expect some kind of gratitude, fidelity, faithfulness. One of our South African poets, he describes it very beautifully, the ingratitude of man. He says, fidelity, faithfulness, is said to be a human attribute, which makes a modern gentleman distinguished from the brute. But that supreme fidelity, inborn in every hound, in every dog, which is the mark of man's best friend in man is rarely found. This faithfulness, gratitude, the dog shows it. But man, mankind in general, the most ungrateful of people, one to another and to our maker. If you are not grateful to the, our creator, what is man to man? What? I give you this book and I expect you to be, every time you say, Mr. Dida, thank you very much, you know, for that book. Thank, I expect that from you? No, I don't expect it. I shouldn't expect, because if I, get, if I expect that, I'll be disappointed in mankind. I won't do anybody any good at any time. Say, so look, these are all ungrateful wretches. Let them go to hell. I said, no, no, that's not my job to send people to hell. I said, no, I must do my best. I don't expect any reward from anybody at any time. He's ungrateful. He's given to hasty deeds. Everything he does in a hurry, and then he regrets afterwards. And on and on and on. What do you want to know? You want to know about Jesus, open J. Everything about Jesus. You want to know about Moses, everything about Moses. You want to know about marriage in Islam, under M. You want to know about divorce in Islam, under D. What do you want to know? Everything on your fingertips. Now this book is yours. There's no bluff. You see, the only thing you have to do is collect these cards. 
these cards will be given out to you at the end of the talk. Each and every one is entitled to have a card. Only one, please. This card, you take it to 124 Queen Street, opposite the mosque in Queen Street. There's our uh, Islamic television there in the window. Next door, there's our shop there, also Islamic vision, 124, 126, the address is given here. You go and present this, that's all. You give this card, and they give you a book, this encyclopedia of 2,000 pages. How much? How much? Free. Free. The only thing you have to do is take this little amount of trouble to go and give the card to get your book. Give your card, get your book. Now, what you do, suppose you take this card, and before you go out, somebody tells you, man, you will get caught with this book. This book is going to capture your mind. It's going to enslave your mind. And if you get terrified, what you do? Tear it and throw it away. There's one book gone. Just tear it and throw it away. But you owe it to yourself. You owe it to yourself. There are in the world today 1,000 million Muslims. Just from the point of view of knowing how their minds are working. Just from that point alone. You want to know what does his book say about what and what and what. The guy, the Muslim fellow, who comes to you and you make an appointment. And the guy turns up late. Now, we are all, all, we, I don't know, most especially we black people, you know, Indians, Africans, coloreds. You know, we are all Muslim or non-Muslim, we are all not punctual. Generally, we are a very unpunctual people. We don't value time. But now, if the Muslim fellow lets you down, you see, he has something to beat him with. And he can't fight back. You ask him, he says, you Muslim? He says, yes, I'm Muslim. He's very proud to say he's a Muslim, yes. And you're late? He said, well, you know, he said, wait, 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 you. You are going through a special training of punctuality. Once a year, for 30 days, you are so punctual to the second, to the minute. In your fasting month, you fast? He said, yes. You fast? He said, yes. When you break your fast, when do you break your fast? Certain fixed time, right? It's right. And you wait with the watch on your hands. Huh? Or in the mosque, you wait for the mu'azin to give the azans. Allah, immediately you break your fast. <laughs> right? Or in the old days, I used to live here as a young boy in Prince Edward Street, and we hear, we wait. You see, when the azan, the time for the breaking of the fast or the time for the evening prayer comes, they switch on the light of the minaret. And the children are waiting in all the street corners. They watch for the light. And they start shouting all over. We used to hear those days. He says, Bhatti Silgi, Roja Choro. He says, the light is on, break the fast. Light is on, break the fast. And everybody starts. <laughs> Straight away, no wasting of a second. Right? For 30 days you did it. To the second. And you can't meet an appointment. You are the fittest guys in the world for appointments. For punctuality. That's what you are trained for. And you give it to him. You find a guy eating pork chops. You know, say, you Muslim? He says, yeah. He says, you know, I thought your book says you can't eat the pig. He says, no, this is ham. He says, look now, what do you talk about? <laughs> That's a pig, man, piece of pig. Call it ham, call it bacon, call it Vienna sausages. It's pig. <laughs> Tell him so. So, can you see now, if you just know, it puts you on a better wicket. And I want to put each and every one of you on a better wicket to put the guy right. My Muslim brothers and my children. Put them right. And you will get pleasure in it. Because... No, by God, because you are not creating offense. You said, look, this is your teaching, Mr. D-Dad. This is your teaching. You know? So, this is what I'm offering to you. This book, is, it's a book of ornament, ornamental for you from, from the knowledge point of view. The psychology of man, you know, about religion in general. Ah, you want to know about karma. Have you heard the word karma? Yes. yes. There's a Hindu term, karma. The law of cause and effect. The law of cause and effect. That every action has a reaction. Beautiful. We believe in that. Everything you do, it has its repercussions. Karma. You want to know about karma? Open K. In this book. And you say about karma. You want to know about lingam? I don't know whether you know. Look under L, you'll find lingam. There. In this book. Believe me. In this Quran, what do you want to know? So you owe it to yourself that you take this little trouble of carrying this card and going along and redeeming it for this book. 
absolutely free of charge. Now, my dear children, Mr. Chairman and the lady here, I leave myself open to questions, any questions. You can ask any questions. Even criticism will be welcome. I assure you, my children. This old man can take it. <laughs> I am yours. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Dirac, for that rather enjoyable and enlightening talk. Uh, please feel free to ask Mr. Dirac any questions whatsoever. Yes, my child. If you come a little closer, please, please don't be shy. Please don't be shy, so that the camera can also catch your question. <laughs> if you don't mind, no harm done. Okay, uh, what are Jews mic? and Muslims enemies? Are the Muslims and the Jews, are they not enemies? Why are they enemies? Or why are they enemies? Yes, thank you for your question. Now, we as Muslims and Jews, or Muslims and Christians, or Muslims and Hindus, we are not enemies to one another. But we are at war. The Jews and the Muslims are at war. What are they fighting about? They are fighting for a piece of land called Palestine. My brothers, the Arabs, they say Palestine belongs to them. My cousins, the Jews, they say Palestine belongs to them. It's a battle for the land. We have between brothers and brothers. Brother, they're all, you know, among us especially. Father dies, and you find that this estate can't be settled. They must go to court. They must go to court. You know, the, the dividing the shares, the inheritance. There's a war after war. Every Indian, I'm talking about the Muslims. You see, I don't know about the Hindus so much. But I know my own people. You have to go to court. You have to go to court. So, this is brother and brother. We are brothers and cousins now. And both are claiming the same piece of land. What are the rights and wrongs of it? You say, now that is something that we can discuss. We can talk. For example, I'm talking to the Jews. I say, come, come and talk to me. I'm talking to the Jews. I've spoken to them at the University of Cape Town. I've spoken to them here at the Natal University. I have had so many discussions with them. I have written a book. Arabs and Israel, Conflict or Conciliation. And I send it to every influential Jew in the country in South Africa. The reaction was, <laughs> they want to kill me, they want to bomb me. I said, come, come, <laughs> talk to him. So I got it all recorded, you know, when they phone up and they use abusive language and what they're going to do to me and all that. I said, come and talk. Because my book says, call them. Call people to a dialogue. Come, let us talk. See if we can see reason. So, it is not Muslim want to kill Jews or Jews wanting to kill Muslims. Because we have lived together, Muslim and the Jews, for over a thousand years, no problem. You see, in Spain, the Muslims ruled Spain for 800 years. And the Jews were the second highest in the hierarchy, doing work among the Muslims. The, the greatest achievement of the Jews was by the Jews in Spain and the Muslim rule. And for a thousand years, when the Christians were persecuting the Jews, and when they ran, for shelter, protection, refuge, they went to Muslim lands. And every Muslim country accepted them with open arms. It's a ahlan wa sahlan. It's a family and plain. You know, come and live among us. We are the children of the same father, Abraham. Abraham had two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. You are the children of Isaac. We are the children of Ishmael. As such, we are brothers. Come, live together. And they live for a thousand years. Not a single right against the Jews. Not a single, nothing. The only time the problem started was with Palestine. When the Jews, they went to seek shelter there, and they went, and they went, and they filled up, and then they said, now we will take over. For the first time, the Muslim wakes up to the reality. He says, now everything, this guy is going to take it over. Inch by inch, inch by inch, the guy's got in. Now, he's got the backing of the Western nations, and he's technologically he's more advanced than the poor Palestinians illiterate, ignorant people, and he says, now nah, these are easy meat for them. So now they wake up, he says, no man, this is not right. So this conflict from 1918 onwards, prior to that, no problems between the Muslims and the Jews. Any other question? Yes, my son. What's your opinion of Muslims 
satanicus. Well, as the words say, satanic. The guy is satanic. The guy who wrote the satanic verses is satanic. You see, the trouble is that bulk of the people, nobody has really read the book. In the Royal Albert Hall, I went and spoke about that book of Rushdie. 6,000 people. And I made the chairman to read the introduction. There's a poetic introduction, a quotation by uh, Daniel Defoe, you know, some literary man. His quotation about the devil. So I made the chairman to read it from the satanic verses. And the chairman read it and is asking 6,000 people, anybody at any time has read this? You know, that, or you have seen it anywhere? Or you read anywhere? Out of 6,000 people, one guy put up his hand. Where? In the satanic verses. Then I'm asking the people, <laughs> the audience. I said, you see, Rushdie has something special to tell about you, you Londoners. I said, you know, on the very first page, he calls you all bastards. You Londoners are all bastards. Do you know that? No. I said, Londoners, I said, you, whether you are an English Londoner, or a Pakistani Londoner, or a Sikh Londoner, or a Hindu Londoner, you are a Londoner, you are a bastard. <laughs> Shocked. Shocked. I said, I said, look, what have you been reading? You say this book is very good. I said, come on, come on, talk to me. Then, of course, it was a, more than an hour's talk. I'm giving him what he says about Rama, what he says about Sita. Did you read it? He says, no. I said, you will want to kill him, you. What is about you white people? The whole white race. He says, white women, no mind, <laughs> fat, Jewish or non-differential. White women, I can't say. There are other words. What, are, what they are good for. I can't. But I said, now you talk to me. You want to know? I said, you white man, you know what he says about your mother? Your wife, your sister, your daughter, you Jew? You know what he says about your mother, your wife, your sister? I want to know what are your reactions. When this is what he says about Rama and Sita. This is what he says about all of your whole white race. And on and on and on. The filthiest, dirtiest book in my life I ever came across was the satanic verses. Really satanic. Keep away from it. From the price point of view, at one time it was costing 15 pounds, that's 75 rands. You only waste 75 rands on that? Hmm? It's about 540 pages, 75 rands. Here I'm giving you my son, 2,000 pages, free of charge. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Just a while ago, you told me that Allah is very merciful. Now, uh, I know Solomon Rushdie was terribly wrong, man. but anyway, we're living in the modern times now, and we have freedom of speech and freedom of writing. But that's besides the point. If Allah is merciful, who are we as people to impose judgment on Rushdie? Because, you see, we didn't create Rushdie. He was created by God himself. Right? And who are we to formulate opinions and impose death sentences upon him? when we have God himself to decide. Now, if Allah is merciful, why can't we be merciful? Beautiful. Beautiful. I'm an Hindu student, right? And my scripture is teaching to be obedient, merciful, and sympathetic to fellow human beings. Now, we must sympathize with Rishi. We understand he has a problem. But we, we're not in a position to impose death sentences upon him as a lady by a solar for me. Now, I appeal to the Muslim people and the Muslim in general to forgive Rushdie and give him a break and allow him to apologize and take back his place. My son, very beautiful thoughts. God is merciful and we are expected to be merciful. He is just and we are expected to be just. He is beneficent, we must be beneficent, charitable. He is holy, we must be holy. That is the teaching of Islam. That is the teaching of Hinduism. It's a beautiful teaching. But now, we are also told to respect one another. Now I ask you, what is your name? So you tell me I'm Mr. So-and-so, Naidu, Padiachi, or Mudli, or Gavanda, whatever. They say, ah, yes, 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 yes. I knew your great-grandmother. <laughs> you know? Because a lot of people, I know their grandfathers and grandmothers. I, I'm 73 now. Since I was a young man, 
I have been moving around a lot, you see, I know. So I said, yeah, yeah, your grandma, yeah, man. <laughs> Wiggins Estate, she used to live there, you know? You know she was the biggest whore? <laughs> I said, you know she was international? Not only for Indians. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, if you punch me on the jaw, have I a right to blame you? I said, what am I doing? I'm asking for it. Am I not? I said, what am I doing? Talk, man, talk. Talk nicely about everybody. You swear my mother, look, you can call me anything. I'm big enough. I told you. I said, this old man can take it, if you remember. You know, I said, ask any questions. Even criticism will be welcome. I said, this old man can take it. I stand by that. But now you come along there while you're asking me questions and you swear my mother. You know, <laughs> at this some you say, I'll punch you on the jaw. <laughs> by God. No, I'm not. Just I'm telling, talking frankly. My mind... It's still 16. In my mind, I'm still 16 year old. I know my body belies that. You see? But my mind tells me I can give it to you. And I will punch you on the jaw. Maybe I'll break your jaw and also break my hand. <laughs> because it's gone too soft now. It's not what it was before. You see? But now, this is the natural reaction of anybody. You swear, my mother? Look. Call me anything, man. Call me an ox. Call me a donkey. Call me a fool. I can tolerate you. But leave my mother out of the picture. You understand? Don't talk about my mother. Don't talk about my wife. Don't talk about my daughter. Now there, I'm going to go berserk. You blame me for that? You see, the Western law, beautiful. It protects the living. If I call your mother a whore, your mother has a right to take me to court. Did you know that? She has a right to take me to court for besmirching her fair name. I call her a whore. I must go and prove it. In the house of Islam, as a Muslim, in a Muslim country, if I call your mother a whore, I must produce four witnesses to prove it. That I saw her actually committing adultery. Not one, now I saw another three witnesses. We all are eyewitnesses. And all the witnesses, you know, if they have to come to testify against your mom, they'll have to be consistent in their evidence and the cross-examination. If one of them fails, all the four will get 80 lashes each. You besmirch the fair name of a lady? Now, that is Islamic law, Western law, law of defamation. You say something about a living person, that person has a right to take you to court. That you know. But you see, Western law doesn't protect the dead. Your mother is dead. And I call her a whore. And I'm a big bully. I have a big gang behind me. I say, ah, go on, do what you like. What can you do? What can you do? Nothing. You're helpless. Because the law doesn't protect. They say, look, then now we must bring your mother out of the grave to come and say, look, I'm no, I was not a whore. <laughs> which we can't do, so the stigma sticks. So that guy, I have no right to forgive. If somebody saw your mother, or I saw your mother, these people have no right to forgive me. Your mother has a right. If she's living, she has a right to forgive me. You forgive me, your brothers and sisters forgive me, your father forgives me, your mother for But if your mother is dead, if she's dead, <laughs> I get away with it. So this is the law why the man says, now you say something about my mother which is blasphemous and the law of blasphemy in the house of Islam is death. Yes, anybody else? Yes, my son. Uh, just one second, one second. Let's give that young man a chance first and we come back to you. Yes, my son. But uh, you believe in Satan? Yes, that there is a power, satanic powers. I do believe. Yeah. Yeah. How come it's... Uh how come you, you say this? How come they only oppose the Christian religion and not uh, Islam? Maybe they have nothing to chew on. You see, the satanic people, what do you say? The satanic, there's a cult. Is that what they're attacking the Christians, you say? Right. Because they come from Christian background. Sit down, sit down, my son. You see, they come from a Christian origin. All the satanists, they were not Hindus before they became satanists. They were not Muslims before they became satanists. What were they? The background. Christianity. So in other words, they come from that background. They know more about the background. So they attack that background. I think that is the answer. Why they, they, would they want to attack the Christians and not the Hindus, not the Buddhists, not the Muslims? Why? 
I said, no, they have no knowledge about Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam. They have no knowledge, but they have knowledge about Christianity, so they can play on that. I think that is the reason. Yes, my son, you had something. Why do the Muslims wear a hoodie? Why do they wear a, a, a topi or whatever you want to call it? Uh, this is, from the religious point of view, in our relationships with God, it's not a necessity. This is not a necessity. But in society, we need an identity. Suppose I meet you in the street, all right, I might think that maybe he's a Tamilian, and if I knew how to say good morning to you in Tamil, I would have said it. Otherwise, now I'm at a loss. That the other guy, like me, who looks like me, the Banya, they are my cousins. You see, we are the same race. Banyas and me, I'm a Gujarati Muslim. The Banyas are Gujarati Hindus. In our complexions, we are the same. The Banya Hindu and the Banya Muslim is the same. We also have the same surnames, if you know. Muslim Patel, Banya Patel. Muslim Desai, Banya Desai. Muslim Bula, Banya Bula. I'm sure you have come across. Right. So what is all this? No, actually we are one people. Now when I see the man in Gray Street, I'm telling you, but frankly, I pass the people in Gray Street and a lot of people, they smile at me. Now I don't know whether the guy is a Banya Hindu or a Banya Muslim. I don't know. So I also smile. <laughs> because I can't make out. Because I keep on seeing them, their face becomes familiar, as if I know the guy. But now what shall I say? Shall I say Namaste? Shall I say Ram Ram? <laughs> shall I say <laughs> Salaam Alaikum? I say, what shall I say? So because I don't know, I'm not sure, I also give a big smile. Now in the West, my people now, because of this problem, they start saying, hi, hi, you know, <laughs> you're 100% okay, you know, hi, you can't say salam babu, salam bhaiya, or you can't say, what you, you say hi, hi, becomes universal. So we wouldn't like to lose our culture and tradition. I like to wish you, my son, whether you are an African Muslim, I say, salam alaikum. If I see you are an Indian, I say, salam alaikum. Anybody, I go to China, I see somebody, I say, salam alaikum. And that's an open door for us. You see, as soon as it says Salaam Alaikum, I go to a strange place, Hong Kong. I've been there, Hong Kong, Singapore. And you see anybody, says Salaam Alaikum. I says, you know, I come from South Africa. I want to know, where is the mosque? Says, come, 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 I will take you. Otherwise, I'm asking, excuse me, uh, where's the mosque? So what's that? <laughs> huh? I, I don't know, I'm, I'm like a fish. If I recognize somebody, immediately says Salaam Alaikum, and his heart and home are open for me. It's like an open sesame. You know, this, this headgear. So I said, now, for the purpose of recognition that I may wish people, I want my children and my people to have an identity. That, you know, we can wish you, Salaam Alaikum, it's a Wa Alaikum Salaam, and immediately, sh it's a bond is created, immediately. i give an example in the tubes in London. I've been sitting so many times, a man across from me, you know, sitting face to face, in the train, in the tubes. And you dare not open your mouth. You don't know how to start. Because says, uh, excuse me, where you come from? Look, among us, it's so easy. By God, it's so easy. If I say, Salaam Alaikum, what is that? So where you come from? So he tells me, oh, I come from certain states. He says, I come from South Africa. So where? You're from South Africa. He says, Durban. I said, what do you mean Durban? I come from Durban and I don't, haven't seen you. He said, no, no, no. I live here in Springfield like this, like that. Said, Immediate bond. Where you come from? Said, Pakistan. I said, you know, I was also in Pakistan for three years. You know, I was in, shh, born. Immediate bond. But now, the other guy, because they're not used to that, as soon as I ask, he say, where you come from? He says, why, well, that's your business. <laughs> Is that your business? The other guy, I can ask him immediately our culture. He says, are you married? This young fellow here. He says, no. I said, why, what's wrong with you? Huh? Come on, I'll show you, you know, there's Mr. Dida's daughter. <laughs> <Come see. laughs> no, no, this is our culture. Are you married? Yes. And the children? Look, this is to us like we are all open book to everybody. We want to know, we want you to know everything about me and I want to know everything about you. And this does it when I know that this is our cultural background, I can talk to you more freely. Otherwise I'm afraid. If I, as soon as I ask you some question, you say, what are you from the inspectorate, receiver of revenue, <laughs> what is it? Yes, yes, a lady, yes. Why don't females go to the mosque? Yes, why don't females? To the mosque, yes. You see, the mosque, the, the obligation to pray, in the house of Islam is on everybody, male and female. 
we are all obligated. Fasting, same. Pilgrimage, everything that the man does, the woman does. Everything, same. But there is what is called a segregation of the sexes in the house of Islam. Like among the Africans, you say Shonipa. You know, respect for womanhood. See, the man comes along into the crawl, the men go with the men, and the women go with the women. Now, in our culture, it's the same. There is what is called a segregation of the sexes. Men and women are not allowed to freely intermingle. So in the absence of a separate facility in the mosque, where they can come into the mosque without intermingling with men, they pray at home. But now in the mosques in South Africa, provisions are being made. You know, where you have a separate entrance for the ladies, separate ablution facility for washing, toilets, everything separate. They are in the mosque, yet out of the mosque. In other words, what is forbidden is free intermingling. In the house of Islam, means in our teaching, no Muslim man has a right to be alone with a woman who is not his mother or wife or sister or daughter. Everybody else is to keep them at a respectable distance. If I was going to Johannesburg alone in the car, I need company. And if I see you, my sister, my daughter, you standing by the roadside, trying to thumb a lift, my religion says don't give her a lift. Not because you are an African. Even a woman of my own race, don't give her a lift. But if she's accompanied by a man, maybe her husband, maybe her brother, maybe her father, it's an act of charity. Come inside, I'm empty. Where are you going? I'm going as far as Newcastle. It's all right, get in. Free. It's an act of charity. But if the woman is alone, whatever race, my own race, is said, don't give her a lift. Why? Because it is a challenge to man's manliness if he doesn't make some suggestions. This is man, any man, every man. Unless he's a hypocrite or something else wrong with him. A man is a man. He has a woman be beside him and he's traveling alone now. He wants to know, are you married? He says, no. Have you got any boyfriends? I don't know. He wants, are yeah, you married? How long? 15 years. Any children? He says, no. He says, Isn't Mr. Naidu working hard enough? <laughs> Big joke. <laughs> This is man, any man. See, every man is like that. So therefore, he says, now look, before that thing happens, this old man, I'm talking about this old man himself. Look, before that happens, you see now, you are nice and jovial, you are smiling. I say some small joke and you laugh like hell, you know, in the car. Ah, to me, this woman is game. <laughs> She's fair meat. This is man, any man, every man. So, Islam says, keep him at arm's length. I must keep you respectfully at a distance and you keep me at a respectable distance. This is the reason there is no free intermingling of the sexes. Yes. Yes, my son. With all due respect to your religion, may I know what is the purpose of circumcision? Because I mean, hey, now, if I were to join your wisdom uh, sect as such, and that hurts. Right. <laughs> agreed, agreed. Uh, the young man wants to know about circumcision. <laughs> I know. That is the biggest barrier, you know, in we getting converts. The man says, man, I agree with you, I agree with you, everything is fine, you know. I said, look, man, you mustn't eat the pig. He said, but well, what's wrong, man? I said, well, I'll reason with you. He said, well, I can see your point. I said, look, you mustn't drink. He said, but uncle, a little nip or a tot, man. I said, look, my son, these are the dangers. He said, well, I can see your point. I said, no, don't be promiscuous. Don't go along and dance with other people's wives and daughters. And I said, but what's wrong, you know, uncle? I said, look, I will reason with you. And he says, uncle, I see your point of view. But now you agree with everything. And I said, now, nah, circumcision. <laughs> That's hard. <laughs> So now I said, now what is this? I said, my son, this is for your own benefit. Look, now I'm talking objectively. Yesterday, the day before yesterday, it was in our local paper. Cancer, the cervix of the cervix of, in women. Which is a killer among women. Cancer of the womb is a killer of women. 85% of all women who suffer from cancer of the womb are wives of uncircumcised husbands. Problem. I went to the R.K. Khan hospital some years ago. I had a problem. And I'm sleeping there on the bed. So, this is our culture. See, we say you, what are you here for? <laughs> what are you here for means what's your problem? What's your name, Mr. Reddy? So he tells me, I say, uncle, mm, it's, you know, it's like this, like that, and mm, what? He says, problem with the foreskin, circumcision. 
Next to me is a young boy, school boy. I said, what's wrong with you? <laughs> he said, no, nothing wrong with me. <laughs> I said, no, no, no. <laughs> no, no, I want to know what brings you here. You know, why are you here? So he says, you see, uncle, uh, <laughs> difficult, difficult. So he's telling me, actually, he's got constriction. He must be circumcised. Circumcised. He's also ready. Look, no insults upon the ready. The ready is here, so many. <laughs> it's just coincidental that the guy next to the wall was ready, grown up man. This guy was ready. Across the aisle, Hindustani gentleman, about 50 years and more. So I go up to him. I said, but yeah, what brings you here? Why are you here? So again, he's in turmoil, he's in torture, he's trying to tell me. <laughs> he's got a problem. He must be circumcised, otherwise the skin has come in the way. I said, you know, I'm telling the nurses. Look, you see, I'm, I'm, as you see me, I enjoy talking. <laughs> so I, I said, you know, you, your husband, is he circumcised? He said, no. Your husband, is he circumcised? He says, no. I said, hey, you got a problem. I said, tell them all to be circumcised. <laughs> Not for religious reasons. Hmm? I said, as much as we are vaccinated, for what? Our government tells us, according to the health regulations, that if you are vaccinated, there's less likelihood of you getting smallpox and this and that. Uh, diphtheria, anti-diphtheria, this thing. And all that, is they're doing it to you, for what? To save you. They give us vaccination, inoculation against smallpox, typhoid and all that, before you go overseas. What for? They hate you? No but for your benefit. So now this circumcision, I said, if I came into power in this country, I will pass a law, circumcise every male child in the country, Indian, African, colored, white. Nothing to do with religion. I said, for health reasons. I said, 85% of my children, my daughters, who are married to uncircumcised husbands, they are suffering from cancer of the womb, a killer disease among women. I said, just to save that, there are so many other philosophical aspects. You come and see me, and I will give you further details, which I can't share with you here. But I said, now, just that alone, 85% of the women who suffer from cancer of the womb are wives of uncircumcised husband. I say, circumcise everybody. It's a, that operation. You know how easy it is. You see, previously, under primitive condition, the septic, this thing lasted for a long time, and you suffered. Man, I had a young man circumcised on, on a Sunday morning and Monday morning on a bicycle he went to work. It is, as, it is as difficult as that. You know, Sunday he gets operated on and Monday morning he's riding a bicycle, he's making deliveries. Yes, my children. Anything else? Yes, my son. Uh, a chat is because of the conflict between God and Satan and the ultimate prophecy of the ultimate defeat of Satan by God, which is shown in the Bible. I didn't hear the detail of your question, but I think it's again about God and Satan. I think if you come a little closer, please, I'm sorry. I can't hear too well from that distance, yes. You listed that uh, uh, when they asked you about uh, Satan and Satan and Christians. Right? Say, uh, uh, Christian, uh, no, Satanism. Oh, yes, Satanism and Christians. I don't know really Satanism, what is the philosophy, why they are out to promote Satanism. Maybe Satanism gives them that freedom to do anything and everything which religion doesn't allow you. Hinduism won't allow you this thing, that thing, that thing, you won't allow you. It tells you, no, thou shalt not commit adultery. Hinduism says that, you know, uh, Islam says that, Judaism says that, thou shalt not kill. We have certain common denominators. But now, as soon as the person starts straight, straight jacketing you, as a Hindu, as a Muslim, you want to be free to do what you like. You want to behave like an animal. You want to behave like a pig. People want to behave like pigs. So now the best thing is to disown. She has to disown religion altogether. And they said, now this is a new cult. They call it Satanism. But now the battle is 
with us. Every individual, we say, we believe, that we have all got this propensity for evil. We have two qualities in us, towards godliness and towards earthliness, devilishness. So the battle is on uh, in all of us, everyone. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, he described the situation beautifully to his companions. While they are around him, he's telling them that shaitan, that's Satan or devil, shaitan courses through the body of man like the blood. He's passing through you. He's each and every fiber of you. He permeates you. Everybody. Shaitan, man means mankind. Shaitan courses through the body of man like the blood. It's imperceptible. It's there. Your blood is moving and going and doing the job without you feeling that the heart is pumping and now supplying blood to the brain for, to allow me to think. Without that I can't think. But all this is all automatic. Similarly, this evil propensity also in man is permeating him like the blood. Everybody. Muhammad says, yes, everybody. He said, what about you? See, they, they had the right to ask questions. You too. He says, me too. But mine is under control. Only difference is that the temptations are there, everybody, unless there's something wrong with you. You remember I described before? Something wrong with you. You are impotent or you are, are uh, uh, lunatic. There's a different matters. But otherwise, everyone, we have these propensities and the battle is on. And we are to overcome those evil propensities. You say, the devil, the devil. You go and steal and you blame the devil. You go and rape and murder and you blame the devil. I want to know whether the devil came to you with horns, with a tail, with a barbed hook, with a ready complexion and he told you to go and rape that woman. Did he? No. What is this devil you're talking about? It's you yourself. You are that devil. You are that Satan. But now very easy to pass the buck. Blame the some, some other guy. You know, he, you know, he do, told me to do this. And he, who told you? Did you see him? Did he whisper in your ears? What did he say? Did he speak to you in English or Zulu? That Satan you're talking about. What did he tell you? In Tamil? What did he tell you? <laughs> so, this is like a good thing. Passing the buck. The thing is, it's with you, in me, in you, in me, and we are to give battle to these forces through the guidance of God. Whatever God tells us, He says, no, I shall not do it, I'm programmed. So we are shown the two broad highways according to the Quran, two broad highways, one leading to salvation and the other leading to hell. The choice is yours and you have the freedom of choice. That will, freedom of will is given to you. You make your choice and you make your decision and therefore you are accountable. You will have to pay for it. You might get away here, but not in the hereafter. Yes. You want me to continue? Yes. So if you have any more questions, I'm here. You think you have had enough? <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you for your questions. That brings us to the end of our presentation. And once again, to our guest speaker, Mr. Amadidat, thank you very much. Thank you.